There are many misconceptions about PoStar and USTAR. We will analyze and debunk them all. In this series, we will discuss many topics, such as state of the whole people, peaceful coexistence, the PoStar and USTAR economy, the fall of the USSR, and many more topics. So, if you are interested in PoStar and USTAR, be it as a leftist or just a curious person in general, just lay back and enjoy my video. Debunking Misconceptions of the post on USSR, Episode 6, Leonid Brezhnev's Economic Reforms. Also, before I start this video, I want to quickly say that we will go in chronological order, or we'll at least try to go in chronological order as much as possible. So, we will start with the abolishment of the Sof in 1965, and we'll stop at the 1915... 1979 Kosygin reforms. Many, like Mavin Hovjes, say that Brezhnev's economic reforms destroyed central planning and established capitalism. Is this true? No, that's wrong and we will debunk all arguments made by Mao, by Mao Hovjes, Dekhat and others against Brezhnev's economic reforms. Anyway, let's start now with the abolishment of the Sovonarchozy in October 1965. Abolishing them is actually one of the first things that Brezhnev did. What the Sovonarchozy were and whether they destroyed central planning and socialism or not. Spoiler. They didn't destroy central, central planning and didn't destroy socialism and were thus not revisionist was explained by me in episode 5 of my post on USSR series already. I'll put the link of episode 5 in the description, but in a nutshell, Khrushchev created economic regional councils all over the USSR. These economic councils implemented plans that Moscow gave, so there was still central planning, and the economic regional councils couldn't do anything without state approval, so yeah, again. Central planning stayed the same, and this reform pretty much cha changed nothing other than the fact that now things were done a bit more slowly, which was more inefficient than stone era planning, and this created more corruption. For these reasons they were abolished. The, 1960, the 1957 Sovnarkhoza reform also abolished industrial ministries, which were brought back in 1965, to quote Aleknov and a USR archive document. The same degree finally eliminated the Sovnarkhoza and restored the industrial ministries with almost pre Sovnarkhoz powers, one important difference being the attempt to concentrate in Gosnap, the State Material Technical Supply Committee, the function of disposal which departments of ministries formerly exercised, source in economic history of the USSR by Alec Nov, page 383. Republican and other regional planning organs lost powers. Source in an economic history of the USSR by Alec Nauf, page 383. The degree that Alec Nauf is talking about was the degree that abolished the Sovnarkhozy, which also talked about abolishing the Sovnarkhozy and bringing back industrial ministries, to quote it. Recognize the need to abolish the Republican Councils of National Economy and the Councils of National Economy of Economic Districts. This is basically talking about the abolishment of the Zovnarkhozy. Article 13. The Council of Ministers of the USSR shall carry out the necessary organizational measures arising from this law, as well as consider the comments and suggest suggestions made by deputies during the discussion of the issue of improving the management of industry. Also, this reform returned the industrial branch ministries that the Sovnarkhozy reforms of 1957 abolished. Here are all ministries that were returned. If this is too fast, just pause the video if you need. By the way, this reform returned all the ministries that the 1957 Sovnarkhozy reforms abolished, and the ministries were finally the ones implementing plans again. Also, remember how the ghost plan was split in two? It was again made into one thing, according to the according to the document. Anyway, planning was 100% 100% the same again as it was under Stalin, to quote Alek Nov. By 1970, not much was left of the additional managerial powers ostensibly granted by the 1965 reform, so the plans and policies of the decade of the 70s were applied within the traditional system of centralized planning, with multiple obligatory targets imposed on management and administrative allocation of inputs, a task divided three ways.
between gospel and gospel and ministries. As will be argued later in detail, the inherent impossibility of efficient and effective centralization underlay many, if not most, of the problems faced by the economy. A so-called reform was promulgated in 1974, but this in no way tackled the fundamental issues. It was on balance, a centralizing measure with a multiplicity of compulsory plan indicators imposed from above. Source, An Economic History of the USSR, 1917-1991, by Alknov, page 384. Also, remember how Khrushchev returned the Supreme Council of National Economy of the USSR, Council of Ministers and the Council of National Economy of the USSR, because he, wa because he was, we could say, re-centralizing and kind of started the abolition of the Sovnarkhozy, the Sovnarkhoz experiment was a failure, so to keep it for a bit longer and improve it, some recentralization methods were used, but since the Sovnarkhoz were abolished anyway by Brezhnev, there was no need anymore for the Supreme Council of National Economy of the USSR, Council of Ministers and the Council of National Economy of the USSR, so they were abolished as well by Brezhnev, to quote the document again. Article 12. In connection with the stipulated by the present law changes, in the organization of management in industry to abolish the Supreme Council of National Economy of the USSR Council of Ministers and the Council of National Economy of the USSR. Anyway, um, if you don't believe me, you can, you can just watch my um, Khrushchev economic reforms video that I'll put in the description. So, um, yeah, then you'll see that Khrushchev brought them back and they didn't exist before him. They did under Lenin, but Stalin abolished them in the 1930s because, um, yeah, they they kind of weren't needed anymore for Stone. I mean, in Stone's opinion. But anyway, now, let's move on to the Lieberman Cossigian reforms. The Lieberman Cossigian reforms are the reform for which Khrushchev and especially Brezhnev are the most attacked for. Mao and Hoja accused the reform of destroying centralized planning and accused it of re reintroducing capitalism and making profit the main motive to produce. Is this all true? No, of course not. Let's first answer how central planning was still preserved, to quote Lieberman and Kosijin. All the main levers of central planning are... Also, um, you can also just translate this as... All the main instruments of central planning are prices, finance, budget, accounting, large capital investments, and finally, all the cost, labor, and most important, in the field of production, distribution, and consumption, will be completely de determined from the center. Yevsey Lieberman, Plan, Profit, and Awards. Thus, for enterprises, the following will be determined from above. The volume of production sales, the main assortment of production, the fund of payroll and wages, aka salary, the amount of profit and rentability, what rentability is in this context is what we will talk about later, Payments to the to the budget and allocations to the budget. In addition to these indicators, on them will also be imposed. The volume of centralized capital investment and entry into the admission into the operation of production capacities and fixed assets. The main tasks are for the introduction of new equipment and indicators of material technical supply. Other indicators of economic activity will be planned by the enterprise independently. Alexey Kasigin, source Pravda from 1965, number 271. Basically, central planning still continued to exist, and Lieberman and Kasigin wanted to, to continue to exist with the state planning all the big tasks. The small tasks, as we said, would have been done by the enterprises, which isn't a big problem. More on that will be said later. Let's first talk more, more about what the state was still doing and how central planning was still preserved. Let's further quote Lieberman and Kasigin again. It is clear that the organizing, upbringing and controlling work of the party and economic apparatus will remain the decisive force. 
but this force will increase a lot if it is supported from below by full interest by full interest in the success of the enterprises. Yevsey Liberman, Plan, Profit and Awards. The proposals submitted on the plenum are based on the leading role of centralized plant management in the development of the national economy. Alexey Kasygin, Source Pravda from 1965, number 271. Also, just so you know, there was a reform called the pilot scheme and there were Lieberman reforms in 1964 under Khrushchev. It was basically the same as the Kosygin reform of 1965, but was, an ex but was an experiment on a small scale, whereas the Kosygin reform of 1965 happened all over the USA. Also, let's further quote um, Kosygin to prove that the Lieberman Kosygin reforms preserved central planning and didn't destroy central planning. The Gosplan of the USSR should play the main role in establishing order in the planning of capital construction. Despite the pressure from state departments and local bodies, the Gosplan must, strict, must strictly observe the correspondence between financial and material resources and the amount of capital works in the plan. Alexey Kasygin Source Pravda from 1965, number 271. Okay, so Kasigin says that the Gosplan should plan finance and resources. That's pretty good, right? But he also says the word capital, for which everyone will get pissed now. He says that, he says that the Gosplan should plan capital construction, capital investments and capital works. What is cap capital in this context? To quote a Soviet book from 1981, which gives a brief definition of capital under socialism. Capital investment under socialism, the aggregate of expenditures allocated for the creation of new fixed assets and for the mon modernization and expansion of existing fixed assets, which function both in the production and non-production spheres. Source, A Dictionary of Political Economy by Mikhail Ivanovich Volkov, page, three, uh, page 31. So it's not really capital, but just planning, aka investing in material resources like tools. And Kasigin wanted the Gosplan and the state to plan material, material resources. Like he wanted the state and the Gosplan to plan how they will give how they will be given to enterprises, for example, and so on. To further quote Kasigin. In this regard, we should mention the tasks of the Gosplan of the USSR. The Gosplan should focus on ensuring the rise to economic proportions and relationships, improving the efficiency of public industry and finding resources for accelerated growth of national of national income and improving the well-being of the people. Of particular importance here will be a deeper, more careful development of national economic balances, particularly the balance of national income and its use, the balance of labor resources and their use all over the country and throughout our regions, the balance of national income and the expenditure of the population, the balance of financial resources. And also the most important material balances. Alexey Kasygin, Source Pravda from 1965, number 271. Basically, Kasygin wants the Gospan to plan material resources, labor resources, finance and income. To further quote him on material resources, labor resources and income. Let's start with material resources. The strengthening of Khozrashot and economic stimulation of production depend on the basis on which the state provides tools and funds to the enterprise and in which order the enterprise allocates part of their income to the state budget. Alexey Kasygin, Source Pravda from 1965, number 271. On the basis of the decisions that were approved this year and especially during the period from 1966 to 1967 should be conducted a lot of work by the Gosplan, the Ministry of Finance, the State Committee on the Questions of Labor and Wages, the State Committee of Prices, the State Bank, 
and also by the industrial branch ministries for the drafting of regulations, guidelines and taking into account the features of each industry and even groups of enterprises. Alexey Kasygin, source Pravda from 1965, number 271. The Gospel ensured solid labor resources throughout the regions of the country and provide for the placement of production and construction and construction in national economic plans that would ensure a more complete use of labor resources in the national economy. Alexey Kasyan, Sword Pravda from 1965, number 271. Basically, Kasyan wanted the state and the Gosplan to plan material resources, labor resources, and income, as I said, and other stuff. And he wanted the state and the Gosplan to give the, uh, to give and sell tools and resources to the enterprises and wanted the state and the Gosplan to decide income and pay workers. So how did central planning change then if everything was so centralized planned and stayed the same? In a number of ways, let's start with the fact that enter enterprises started to work on a full ho on a full shot basis, to quote Kosygin. The proposed measures to improve the organization of management and strengthen and strengthen the economic methods of industrial management are based on a combination of unified state planning with full shot of enterprises, centralized industry management with a broad local, local economic initiative and with the principle of unity of command within, a, within an increased role of industrial collectives. Alexey Kasygin, source Pravda from 1965, number 271. All this can be only achieved when centralized plan management is combined with the economic initiative of enterprises and collectives with the strengthening of economic levers and material incentives for the development for production with full Hozra Shot. Alexey Kasygin, source Pravda from 1965. Number 271. Okay, so Kasygin wanted central planning and full Hozara shot at the same time. What is full Hozara shot? To quote a Soviet book from 1980. Expressed by the concept of full Hozara shot, the economic position of the main link of public industries, enterprises, pro production associations is characterized by property and separate organization necessary for independent participation in commodity turnover. In legal terms, this is expressed in granting a full Hozara shot enterprise the rights of a legal entity and assigning a st and strengthening state property to it in the form of fixed, current and special property funds, on the right of operational management establishing its independent responsibility for obligations, etc. Basically, Lieberman and Kasygin wanted enterprises to participate in the making of plans and wanted them to fully, independently implement plans. To quote them on making the enterprises participate in the making of plans. The enterprise creates its own plans based on orders. Yevtei Liberman, again on plan, profit and awards. It is necessary to get rid of the common perception that in a relationship between the leading economic bodies and enterprises, the former only have rights and the latter only have duties. The development of economic, man of economic methods of management. And a widespread introduction of Hozara Shot in industry demands the establishment of mutual rights and mutual obligations in, this, in these relations, increasing the responsibility of enterprises and also of the industrial management bodies. Alexey Kasygin, source Pravda from 1965, 200, number 271. Lieberman and Kasykin wanted enterprises to participate in the creation of plans, but the plans of enterprises couldn't be implemented without the approval of the state and the Gosplan. They basically didn't want enterprises to participate in the creation of plans, but rather wanted them to do suggest suggestions to for su suggestions for plans. To quote Lieberman and Kasygin. Established so that the plans of enterprises after the agreement and approval by the volume nomenclature program, the state shall be completely independently implemented by the enterprises. Yevsey Liberman, plan, profit and awards. 
this work should be carefully organized by the Gosplan and carried out under its supervision and control. Alexei Kasygin, Source Pravda from 1965, number 271. Okay, so what did the reform change in terms of central planning? The reform gave more independence to enterprises. How? By decreasing the amount of planned targets that the state shall plan and by making enterprises plan small tasks. Which ones, you may ask? Let's quote Albert Zimanski to find out. A series of new reforms that were implemented between 1971 and 1973 that restored a number of the preciously dropped planned targets for enterprises, raising the total from 8 to 14 or 15. The centrally planned enterprise targets which have been added are in the field of 1. Labor productivity 2. Gross output 3. Consumer goods 4. Quality. 5. Economy in the use of material and physical uh, resources. And 6. The size of the income and incentive fund. Source. Is the red flag flying? By, by Albert Zimanski. Page 40. So you may ask me now, what has the 1971 reform to do with the Lieberman Cossigian reforms? Well, they abolished it. Um, I mean... The 1971 reform abolished it. The reason as to why the Lieberman Cossigian reforms were abolished was due to the fear that they'd become inefficient. So basically, labor productivity, gross output, consumer goods, quality, economy in the use of material of material and official resources and the size of the income incentive fund were then planned again by the state. From 1964 to 1971, on the other hand, these tasks were planned by enterprises. Let's further quote Lieberman and Kassigian to verify this. In order to expand the economic independence of enterprises, it is proposed to reduce the number of planned targets given to enterprises from above. Alexey Kassigian, Source Pravda from 1965, number 271. Instead, it is necessary to give enterprises the opportunity to calculate for themselves the optimal combination of indicators that will achieve the final effect, the best products that, con that consumers really need and, and demand. With the greatest level of rentability in production, Yevsey Lieberman plan profit and rewards. Enterprises that work on a Hosra short basis and their managers should be fully responsible for the economic results of their work. Alexei Kasygin sourced Pravda from 1965, number 271. What does, what does practically need to be done so that in the new conditions Khosra Shot can be strengthened and developed? Firstly, it is necessary to create conditions under which enterprises can independently solve, uh, solve questions on how to improve production and, and so they are interested in using production funds that are assigned to them for increasing the volume of industrial output and the volume of received profit. Alexei Kasygin, Source Pravda from 1965, number 271. With the execution of these measures, the size of the production development fund which enterprises will be able to independently use for technological improvement of production will amount to a much larger number than at present. Alexei Kasygin, Pravda from 1965, number 271. The strengthening of Khosra Shot and economic stimulation of production depend on the basis on which the state provides tools and funds to the enterprise and in what order enterprises allocate part of their income to the state budget. Alexei Kasygin source Pravda from 1965, number 271. To shortly summarize all this, Lieberman and Kasegin wanted enterprises to calculate indicators for themselves. So they wanted enterprises to calculate themselves how much material resources tools and stuff like that they need. They wanted enterprises to judge how efficient their products are and, co and work is. Uh, they wanted enterprises to be responsible for their funds on how much profit and output is created. They wanted the enterprises to be responsible for economic results as in how much is being produced and how efficiently and so on. They wanted enterprises to get technology tools resources and material themselves by buying them from the state. We 
we had their profit fund. Okay, anyway, let's move on now. Workers will continue to be paid by the state and not by enterprises, to quote Kasigin. The enterprise's ability to increase the wages of workers and employees at the expense of sources of income created by the enterprise itself is extremely limited. Alexei Kasigin sourced Pravda from 1965, number 271. Tariff rates and salaries of workers and of employees will continue to increase in a centralized manner. Alexei Kasigin sourced Pravda from 1965, number 271. Okay, so now let's talk about profit. Lieberman and Kasigin supported it and wanted to increase it, to quote them. There is no danger for budget revenues. On the contrary, there is a reason to expect a significant increase in state income under the influence of a strong material interest of enterprises in the overall increase in profits. Yevsey Lieberman planned profit and awards. Third, it is proposed to strengthen and develop Khozrashot, strengthen economic stimulation of production using such means as prices, profit, awards and credit. Alexei Kasigin, source, Pravda from 1965, number 271. Is it revisionist and capitalist to support and increase profit? The answer to that question is no. In fact, Stalin also supported profit and wanted to increase it, to quote Stalin. A certain amount of profit is needed by us. Without profit we cannot create reserves, have accumulation, support fulfillment of defense tasks and satisfy social needs. Here we can see that there is labor for oneself and labor for society. The word profit itself has become very dirty. It would be good to have some other concept. But what? Perhaps net income. Under the category profit we have hidden an altogether different content. We do not have a spontaneous capital flow and no loss of competition. We do not have the capitalist law of maximum profit, nor the law of average profit. But without profit it is not possible to develop our economy. Yosip Stalin, Five Conversations with Soviet Economists, 1941-1952 to we must put an end to inefficiency, mobilize the internal resources of industry, introduce and reinforce Khozrashot in, in all our enterprises, systematically reduce production costs and increase internal accumulations in every branch of industry without exception. That is the way out. Hence, the task is to introduce and reinforce Khozrashot to increase accumulation within industry. Yosip Stalin, new conditions, new, co new tasks in economic construction. By the way, the Khozrashot quote by Stone is from 1931. Some might say that it's in the construction period of socialism. So this quote is illegitimate. Well, it's not illegitimate. Because NEP was ended in 1928 or 20, 1929, and they didn't, um, and they didn't want to return to it. They wanted to go to socialism, and they were already socialists in 1931. So yeah, this is pretty bullshit. Okay, for those who didn't know, to reinforce means to strengthen something. Anyway, basically Stone supported profit and wanted Hozrashot and wanted to strengthen Hozrashot. What is Hozrashot? To quote Wikipedia. Hozrashot, Russian Hozrashot, short for Hozrashot, Hozrashot, economic accounting was an attempt to simulate the capitalist concepts of profit and profit center into the planned economy of the Soviet Union. The term has often been translated as cost accounting, a term more typically used for a management approach in a free market economy. It has also been conflated with other notions of self-financing, самофинансирование, self-revulation, самоокупаемость, and self-management управление introduced in the 1980s, is defined in the Soviet Encyclopedic Dictionary. 
whose the ratio is the method for the plant running of an economic union, for example, of a business in Western terms, based on the confrontation of the expense incurred in production with the production output and the compensation of expenses with the income. Basically, Hosera shot its profit and the amount of autonomy of enterprises. Stalin wanted to strengthen and increase both profit and autonomy for interest for enterprises. What is profit under socialism? Let's quote Lieberman and Kassigan to find out. Let's use an example to explain how the scale is used. Let's assume that the enterprise's balance sheet profit for the year was 7.5 million rubles and the average annual size of its fixed and current assets is 50 million rubles. This means that the enterprise's profitability is 15%. Yevgeny Liberman plan profit and awards. Our profit with plant goals for the products of labor and with the use of net income for the benefit of the entire society is the result and at the same time a measure in monetary form of the actual efficiency of labor costs. You see Liberman plant profit and, and awards. The amount of profit largely determines the contribution of each enterprise to the net income of the country directed to the expansion of production and improvement of the wealth of the people. Alexei Kasigin's Source Pravda from 1965, number 271. Basically, profit under socialism is how much wealth an enterprise produces. So let's say an enterprise has to produce 100 million rubles in one year, but it only produces 40 million in that year. It does 40% profitable, and the profit that it gives is 40 million rubles. It has nothing to do with the extraction of surplus value or wages, to quote Kasigin again. The success achieved by the enterprise in increasing profits and increasing the profitability of production does not directly affect wages of the workers of the enterprises. Alexei Kasigin's source Pravda from 1965 to number 271. Now, an important question remains unanswered. Did Lieberman and Kassigen want to make profit the main motive to produce? No. To quote them. Rentability in our conditions isn't the only indicator of efficiency. First and foremost, we must evaluate the work of the enterprise depending on how it performs its tasks in terms of quantity, nomenclature, quality of products and terms contractual rates based on direct links between suppliers and con consumers are the basis of stable plans and this assessment of suppliers accuracy should be supported by rentability. Sensitive fines should be levied for violations of the terms of delivery. You've seen Liberman again on plan profit and awards. In our opinion, this should not be about achieving the maximum amount of profit. You've seen Liberman again on plan profit and awards. Under the existing practice of material incentives, enterprises are not interested in providing for the most complete use of its internal resources in plants. Since the entire assessment of enterprises' performance and the system of incentives for employees are based on incentives, primarily on primarily for the fulfillment of the plan. Alexei Kasigin's Pravda from 1965, number 271. Okay, so Lieberman and Kasigin opposed the maximization of profit and thought that the most important indicator on how well an enterprise does and the most important economic indicator in general was the fulfillment of plans created by the state. How did Lieberman and Kasigin want enterprises to, to increase and create profit? I mean, to increase profit. By increasing norms, remember the profit scales that Lieberman and Kassigan talked about. Basically, let's say an enterprise has to produce 50 billion, 50 billion rubles in one year, but that's, but that's not enough. So instead, the amount that it has to produce becomes 65 billion in one year. And thus, profit increases. You get what I mean. Lieberman and Kassigan also wanted the profit scales to be centrally approved, to quote Lieberman. For this purpose, new profitability standards should be developed and approved for a long, for a long period of time for each branch of production. 
It is most appropriate to approve these standards in a centralized manner in the form of scales that determine the amount of incentives for enterprise collectives depending on the achieved level of, pro of profitability in the form of profit as a percentage of production funds. Yevgeny Lieberman, Plan, Profit and Awards. Okay, so, but what if an enterprise starts to produce too much profit, too much wealth? What if it produces how, how much it is actually needed already? Well, then um, they, they, the, the incentives are decreased for them. So profit is decreased for them. They don't have to produce that much wealth anymore. To quote Lieberman. If all these excesses now serve as an almost free reserve for enterprises, then on the new order they will be sensitively out of pocket, reducing the amount of incentives. Yevsey Lieberman, Plan, Profit and Awards. Okay, what else is there to tell? It's important to know that Lieberman and Kasigian supported the maximum amount of rentability, to quote Lieberman. At the same time, both the plan and getting the maximum amount of rentability will be beneficial for the enterprises. You see Lieberman again on plan, profit and awards. It's important to know that rentabilness or rentability in English, I think it is, is often falsely translated into profit. And it's not profit. Um, here is the definition of what rentabilness or rentability means. It means... Um, the efficient use of the of an enterprise's resources, okay? And yeah, basically they the Lieberman and Kasigan wanted to wanted the enterprises to use the resources like tools and stuff like that as efficiently as possible. And that's not capitalism, that's that's just basic economics. To quote Kasigan the initiative based on knowledge of the enterprises, efficiency, a sense of the new, the ability to use each specific task with maximum efficiency of resources. This is the essence of new requirements. Alexei Kasigian source, Pravda from 1965, number 271. Okay, so basically Kasigian says the same as Lieberman. Also, there was an effect of usage of resources before the reform, to quote Kasigian. Sometimes an enterprise buys unnecessary equipment just to spend on the received tools. Alexei Kasigian sourced Pravda from 1965, number 271. What about rewards? Rewards already existed on a stone, for example, the Medal for Labor Valley. We rewards were used on the stone and during the Lieberman Cosigian reforms to reward workers and enterprises for fulfilling plans. All what the Lieberman Cosigian reforms did was just further encourage them to reward workers and enterprises for fulfilling plans so they so they are more interested in doing so. Managers also already fired workers on the stone, like this document says from 1949. I translated a piece of it above. What about comp Competition, competition between enterprises and workers to fulfill the plan as well as they can already existed on their stone and it continued to be like that during the Lieberman Constitution reforms, to quote the Soviet book. It is the factory committee which organizes shock bridges and, on behalf of the workers, enters into socialist competition with other factories, offices or institutions as to which they can achieve the most during a period. Source. Soviet Communism and New Civilization, Volume 1 by Sydney Webb, page 183. This episode is going to be way longer than I expected, so I will split this video into two or three parts. This will. This is part one. In conclusion, Brezhnev did not make profit the main motive to produce, didn't restore capitalism, didn't destroy central planning and just made enterprises plan small tasks, small tasks and made enterprises implemented plans fully independently. So basically everything pretty much stayed the same and nothing changed. Like, share and subscribe if you enjoyed. Sources are in the pinned comment of the comment section. Stay tuned for part 2 of episode 6. Goodbye.